it's a privilege for me to be here and to share with you. Um, I'm always amazed at the response of people about commentaries on Leviticus. It was inspired by a comment I heard from a great pastor who said, just as you cannot understand English literature if you don't know Edmund Spencer, you cannot understand the Bible unless you know Leviticus. So it turned out to be a tremendous study in Romans and Hebrews based upon Leviticus, of course. I wasn't sure how the schedule is working here. I notice we have been allotted 15 minutes for lunch. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, you don't need to worry. I'll make sure you don't miss your little box of manna. And, uh, <laughs> knowing that you aren't going to get any on Saturday. <laughs> I don't think they'll let you pick up two for Saturday, so just the one. <clears throat> I will keep us in bounds on the time, and I won't go as far as one of my students when he was preaching in class. He said his sermon was like baloney. He could cut it off anywhere. Uh, but I will try to stop on time and leave us some time for questions uh, and work with, um, within the range of the subject. My interest, my ministry, my life is given to teaching people going into ministry how to preach in the Bible. And for me to try to do something else here today would be wrong. Uh, it's not going to be a sermon, but it's going to be an exposition. And so I would invite you to turn in your word, I'm assuming you have one, um, in our Father's word to the book of Zechariah in chapter 3, which is where we will be for our time. We often say that the church today is facing many challenges that are new, unprecedented, but the more that you analyze them, the more you realize they're not new, they're not unprecedented. They cycle again and again, and yet they do take on a new form. We may not have the old idolatry in all of its crudeness, uh, but people uh, claim to have left God to worship what they call a no-gods, but they really are the gods of power and usury and lust. And as a result, dealing with a skepticism and atheism, agnosticism, that creeps through the whole country. And the sad news is that the secular society and the atheistic society is doing a much better job these days on evangelism than the church is doing. And as a result, I think the challenge is for us not always to be opposing, but to be proposing what it is that is the true faith. And this is something that I want to focus our attention on based on Zechariah today. The problem, of course, in the history of religion is that given a certain amount of time, a great deal of immorality and corruption and false beliefs creep into the system. And unfortunately in our day, they are not only tolerated by the society, they are legalized by the government, and they are sanctified by the priesthood. And we are dealing with some insurmountable objects, but it is Christ and his word that will overcome the world, and therefore we must be involved with that. When I first started in seminary, one of my professors said to remember that God has never promised to bless your words, he's promised to bless his word. And therefore, the more of his word that are in your words will be a greater blessing. And so I want to focus our attention on a message from God. I don't really believe this crowd needs another lecture or another presentation, but I do believe you need to hear from God. And that will come from his word. That's where we want to focus. The situation that we face if you're not fresh on Zechariah, is very similar to today. You will recall that the Israelites in the Old Testament went into captivity because of the great idolatry of the people and the great corruption in the leaders, prophets and priests and kings. And it was all of that corruption, false gods, immorality, 
uh, bribery, miscarriage of justice, the list is immense, that they went into captivity and would be outside the land. No more temple, no more priesthood, no more sacrifices, no more singing the songs of Zion. Instead, they were left to weep and to think what could have happened if they had only obeyed. And they got the chance because it was God's plan to take them back to the land. And he restored them. And so in 536 BC, if you remember your history from the Bible, under the leadership of a king, a would-be king, a prince, Zerubbabel, and the high priest, Joshua, and a couple of prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, they returned to the land. And in returning to the land, they had all the prospects of renewal. They were going to rebuild the temple. They were going to reestablish the priesthood. They were going to begin the sacrifices again. They could once again go up to Jerusalem and sing the songs of Zion. But God said, and not so fast. There's a few things left on the table of unfinished business. And he revealed it in this passage. And so I want to focus on the prospect of God's approach to renewing and restoring a vital ministry in his priesthood. And I think you will see that the parallels are very important even for today. It is not so much for the Israelites to come back and build a temple and build a sanctuary and have the priesthood and have the sacrifices, have all the robes and all the ritual if they aren't changed. And if they themselves are not changed, none of this will matter, none of it will work. And this is what this prophecy is about. The book of Zechariah, written around 500 BC, right after the return, begins with a series of night visions. And in Zechariah chapter three, we have the fourth one. But it's not like the other visions. The other visions are more apocalyptic in nature. Women in flying baskets and so on. That's not this one. This one actually uses a real person, Joshua, who is the real high priest. But as you'll see as we go through the passage, it's not about Joshua. This is a prophetic message to the nation. Joshua was the high priest. The high priest represents the priesthood. The priesthood represents the nation. And the nation from God's calling back in the early days is supposed to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And what was true of the priesthood was also true of the nation. You can't be priests if you're not holy. They go together. And so all the law was given to show them how to be a holy nation so that they could serve God in this world and be the messengers to the world of salvation. And so in this passage, we get a little drama working out. It's a very interesting drama that describes how God is going to, shall we say, clean up the nation and reconstitute them as a kingdom of priests. And while it is about them, and while it is about the immediate need for their restoration to service, it is also prophecy. And as you well know, the Old Testament prophets have an immediate referent, but it's looking forward to something far more important. And that's where we want to end up here today. I hope the trip will not be too painful for you because the prophets are not particularly concerned about that. <laughs> they want to let you know this is what the Lord said, this is what has to happen, or you will be of no use to him. And that is always the case. The chapter is a short one, and I can divide it into three sections. And the first three verses is going to describe the condemnation of Joshua, meaning the nation of Israel. And I think in this particular passage, we're getting both a, well, there's several levels here. One is the, the vision of what happens to Joshua, what it means for the nation, but it also becomes one of the most beautiful pictures of salvation. And they all overlap, they all harmonize. And what it's basically going to be telling us here is that God requires holiness in people who serve him. 
and he will rescue his people from condemnation. This is basic to everything that we are teaching. Let me read you the three verses, and then I want to explain a few things in here because it's very, it's very marvelous the way it's written. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at the right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand snatched from the fire? For those of you interested, Wesley's life verse. But in this particular passage, we have a court scene. The angel of the Lord, I believe to be the Lord himself, as the interchange will take place in the passage between the angel of the Lord and the Lord as a speaker. So it's in the presence of the Lord, and there is a prosecuting attorney, <laughs> and there is a defendant. The prosecutor is Satan. Um, now, I know that there are a lot of people who, when they try to deal with this passage, it was not really Satan. That's just a view that came up later in time. The Hebrew word Satan or Satan means an adversary. Anybody could be an adversary, except that the Bible makes it very clear, Revelation chapter 12, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he doesn't stop night or day. So if you don't want to say this is Satan, it has to be somebody completely driven and governed by Satan. Uh, maybe some member in your church, they're pretty good at accusing the brethren too. Um, I mean, that's, I don't mean that to be funny, that's sad that so many people are willing to do the work of Satan. But he's the accuser, and there's plenty to accuse if you start looking at the picture here. But Satan is the adversary. He is there to be the accuser. In fact, the Hebrew text is very dramatic. Satan is there to Satanize. It's a cognate because the verb is to accuse and the noun is the accuser. So this is what he is doing. And he's not lying. He's there to accuse because there is so much sin. When they went into captivity, what could you say about the priesthood? They were corrupt, they were idolaters, they were fornicators, they were, they were greedy for all the wealth that they could get. You could start down the list of the things that Jeremiah and others laid out upon these people, and you say, yeah, this is, this is a, a very, very corrupt organization. And Satan probably had a field day with all of that. Except that here, the Lord is the one who is supervising the entire thing, and he will have none of it. Uh, we're told here that he says, is not this a brand plucked from the fire? I think the fire meaning the Babylonian captivity. And what God has done is he has restored people, rescued them, returned them to the land. You remember the words of Ezekiel chapter 36, God said to the nation, I'm not doing this for your sake. Uh, it's not this, you're such good people, I want to do this for you. No, I'm not doing this for you because everywhere you have gone, you've made my name stink. I'm doing this for my own name's sake. God has a reputation to preserve. And even though people are unfaithful, he remains faithful and he regathers them according to his promises. That's why we pray, hallowed be your name. It's a prayer for God to fulfill the promises and rescue his name from this world. Uh, and we hope in the process we are not doing anything to tarnish that name by the way we serve, the way we live, the way we minister. But we're told here that the defendant is Joshua. Now he is an actual person. I don't know how he took to this vision when he heard about it because I don't think it's really describing him in detail, but he represents the nation, so it's technically going to be a vision of him. And we're told that he is there as the defendant, He's being accused by Satan, and in verse 3, uh, we read also, Joshua was dressed in filthy garments as he stood before the angel. Uh, the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy garments. Zechariah, like all the prophets, don't mince words. This is a very polished and polite translation. <laughs> it's not that he's there with his 
You know, his white linens of the priesthood and there's a little smudge down on the side. It might look bad. The Hebrew says, excrement bespattered garments. He is filthy. He is foul. There's no other way you can dry, describe sin. Filthy rags, dirty clothes, dirty linen, putrid. This is what he's being described as here, but it's not him only, it's the nation. The nation needs to find renewal in their spiritual life if they're going to be of any use to God. And he represents them. And God is going to, in this dramatic vision, remove the filthy garments and put on the beautiful robes of the priesthood. It's a picture of cleaning up the nation once they're back in the land that they can again serve. But it's also a prophecy and a message from the prophet that no one can serve the Lord in any capacity, whether laity or ordained or whatever, unless they're clothed in righteousness, unless they are living holy lives. That's who God wants to use. And here, when Satan makes the accusation, we're told that the Lord rebuked him. Now, we have to understand this word rebuke. It's a marvelous word, both in the Old Testament and as it's translated in the New. If I rebuke somebody, it's not going to go very far. I'll just tell them what I think. But that's not really this. When God rebukes, it's kind of like he stops them in their tracks. The best illustration in the New Testament where Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves. They immediately stop. So if the Lord says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, it's finished. Shut up. There's no accusation. Nothing will be there because my grace and my forgiveness overrules any charge that you're making. We're reminded of this also for us in the New Testament. Remember in Revelation chapter 12, where it describes Satan as the accuser of the brethren, and it tells us how the saints overcome Satan. And there are three ways. One is by the blood of Christ. It's been paid for. No matter what Satan charges, it's been paid for. The blood of Christ, that takes away the accusation. Secondly, by the testimony of their word. People who know what they believe and can state their faith, Satan resists. Too many people who don't that he can attack. And the third is that they don't cling to life. One of Satan's greatest weapons is death. And it doesn't mean anything to the saint. It's a way to heaven. And that frustrates him no end. But we're dealing here in this passage with the word of rebuke. The accusation of Satan might be true. The nation might be sinful. The priest might still be sinful and might have the wrong motives and not even thought about their spiritual life. Just want to get back, build the temple, do it all over again, start new. It's not good enough. God says, I've got to remove the sin before you can be clothed with the clothes of service, which will be the priestly clothing. And in order to start, let's get Satan out of the way because the accusations won't go anywhere. Not now. Not when I've made a decision. And my decision is, I choose Jerusalem. I choose that because I have a future. I have a plan for that place. And I have a future for this people and a future for this ministry. And I'm going to make sure that it takes place. But first, they have to be cleaned up. So when you list all the sins that Satan might have come up with out of the other prophets and out of the other accusations in Scripture, you realize, yes, very frail, very, very corrupt, but God's grace is sufficient to remove the sin and to restore people to their rightful service. It's the whole picture of redemption all the way through the Bible because it starts really as early as the garden. If you study it carefully, the creation itself was designed to produce humans who would function as Levitical priest type people in an earthly sanctuary. And whatever God had promised to them to rule and have dominion, 
to serve in this earthly sanctuary, to be God's personal representatives. That was the ideal plan that got corrupted with sin down the way. And so when redemption takes place in Exodus, once again, God will restore them to that role of a kingdom of priests. You and I have been brought into that same new covenant now promise. We are a kingdom of priests. Some are ordained to be the leaders of the people. Some are going to be part of the priestly dominion. But it's our task to represent the Lord and minister to him and for him in this world. But God is making it clear in this first little vision that he requires holiness, not harboring of sins and secret desires. All of this hasn't changed. It's still a threat. It's always there. Somebody says, well, we're living in a modern technological age and things are different. Yeah, means you sin faster. That's all. <laughs> it doesn't really do much else. Human nature hasn't changed. And human nature, if left to itself, is incompatible with the service of God. And so God is saying to this people what he's saying to all of us. If you want to bring about renewal, it starts inside you. We've got to make sure you are walking with the Lord and you are clothed in righteousness and that you are living a holy life. So then the second part of this passage is where they're going to robe this high priest and God is going to sanctify him for service because these are all the priestly robes and so it's not just get some clean clothes but a particular kind of clean clothes that will enable him to serve as the high priest. So the message is given, um, taken away the filthy clothes and I will put rich garments on him. This is the expression that describes the, the beautiful robes of the priest when, when they are ministering in the sanctuary with all of the embroidery and the precious gems and the beautiful colors. All of this is going to be put on. So remove the old robes, which represent the sin. Put on the new robes, which represent a sanctification for service because the clothing always represents the person, not just an external thing. And he's going to be now cleansed, renewed, restored, and equipped for spiritual service. But what's interesting in this little vision is how Zechariah gets caught up into it. He jumps up and he says, put a clean turban on his head too. So yeah, they put a clean turban on his head. And uh, he's, I know some of you might want to say miter, but it isn't. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, Got to get a little flavor of the ancient Near East in here. Um, it's the headdress that the priest would wear. And what Zechariah does, he wants to get involved with this because he's as eager as anyone to see that this renewal of temple and priesthood and sanctuary is going to be spiritual, going to be provided by God, going to be enabled by God. And here God is equipping him for service. And that would mean ultimately for the whole nation as well. And then we read the next couple of verses, the charge. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will, have, you will govern my house, have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among those standing here. It's one of those if charges. And it leaves you up to speculate on what if not. Well, he's looking at the if. What is he going to require from this individual, this nation that has been cleansed and restored to their calling, their service? What is he going to give to them? He's going to give a charge, and it's obedience. It's obedience. If you obey what the Lord says, if you keep the requirements, there's no... There's no loopholes here. There's no chance to say, well, uh, those don't apply to us, or this one isn't important. Or, no, this is the word of God. I'm, I've been disturbed a good bit over the last couple of years what I hear from some of the pulpits. Uh, well, I, that's any normal, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there's been a trend recently when, where people will say, well, here the Old Testament and the New Testament says, be perfect. And often I'll hear the preacher say, well, you know, we really can't be, so we have to take that with a bit of a grain of salt. No, we don't. We don't take that with a grain of salt. We are told, be perfect. 
Uh, that's the standard. The Lord never said to people, well, just try the best you can. Um, no, it's, there's a standard. What does Browning say? Man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? You may not get there in the quest, but you are not free to desist from the challenge. And God says, be perfect. That is, you're going to walk with the Lord. You're going to obey. It doesn't mean you're going to remain sinless. It means that when, as a believer, you know you have sinned, you know how to deal with it. You don't cloak it. You don't veil it. You can deal with it and move on. Blameless means you are either, at any, at any given moment, if you're called blameless in the Old Testament, means you're either forgiven or free from sin. One of the two, but not walking in sin, not justifying it, not cloaking it, not concealing it. And ministers are good at that. A little knowledge of the scripture can be a dangerous thing. Eliot said in his um, Murder of the Cathedral that the servant of God has the greater opportunity for sin because he can make the cause serve him. And that's a warning always. And so what God is saying here is that if you walk in my ways, and if you keep my commandments. See, the early priests and the early kings and the early prophets, they forgot that. But if you do that, then here's what I will do for you. You'll govern my house. The house is the temple. It's the house of the Lord. You will have the responsibility and the privilege of leadership over the household of faith. That's what I will give to you. And you will also have access, he says, to those who are standing in this place. And I think the vision is a heavenly vision with Satan and the Lord and Joshua being called before the bar of judgment. And those who have access are the angels and all of the uh, saints who've gone before. And what he's basically telling them, not only will you be a ruler over the household of faith in my house, in the sanctuary, but you're going to have access. Access to what? Access to God, which is immediate, which is direct, which is what really the new covenant is going to be all about, that there is complete and immediate access into the presence of God. You, you step back and you say, well, okay, here you're given this glorious position, and you're going to have the leadership over the household of faith, and you're going to minister in the sanctuary. You're going to have direct access to God. And all I'm asking for you is that you do what I tell you, that you listen to my word and obey it. I've often thought this, this really does sound like a no-brainer no in, the, in the deal that he's offering here. It's kind of like in Deuteronomy when the Israelites are there ready to go into the land and God says, now look, I've set before you today blessing and cursing, life and death. Choose life. <laughs> you'll go into the land, you'll enjoy it. You know, you read that and you say, well, who in their right mind would choose death? <laughs> well, we do. Every time we choose to sin, every time we choose to disobey, every time we rebel, yeah, it's alienating ourselves a little bit more from God and his blessings and continued use in his service. So what he's doing is he's laying the charge out for them. He wants obedience. He doesn't want rebellion. And he will give them privileges that they can't even imagine at this particular point. They could go in there, build a temple, hold services. Not the same. Not if you don't have access to God. It's not the same if you're not living it and obeying it. Remember the words of Malachi just a few years later than Zechariah? in chapter 2 with his rebuke to the priests. And he tells them that God gave his covenant of Levi, that's the priestly covenant, gave them that covenant so that they would fear, and the early priests feared. And they walked in the way of the Lord, they obeyed. And they turned many to righteousness. Fear the Lord, live the faith, proclaim the message, people come to the Lord. Can't get any simpler than that. But that got lost along the way, and it's going to take every generation of true believers in the service of God to get it back. It doesn't stay because human nature being what it is will not say, okay, we have been redeemed and we're sanctified and we're ministers, we're set. No, we're not set. When, you, when do you become bulletproof? 
When do you become resistant to the evil one? It's a constant vigilance in his word. I keep telling my students that the reason that they do exegesis in the text is not to get up a good sermon. It's that they will grow spiritually. And if that doesn't happen, the sermon won't be any good. It's got to, it's got to touch them. It's got to be meaningful to them before it'll be meaningful to anybody else. And this is the charge that God is giving to Joshua. It would be helpful for you to keep in mind on a passage like this what the duty of a priest was. Uh, sometimes that gets lost today with all the other things they put as riders in the contract. But what does a priest do? In Israel, you can read it clearly in Deuteronomy 33, verses 9 and 10. He's got three main duties. One, first, teach the word of God. That's the primary duty of a priest. Secondly, Deuteronomy says burn incense. That means make intercessory prayer. That's when they burnt the incense. And third, make the atoning sacrifice. In other words, show people how to get to God through the sacrifice that makes atonement. You can't have ministry without those at the core. Teach the word, pray for the people, and show them how to get to God through Christ the sacrifice. A number of years ago, there was an article I read about a young man who was a graduate, let's put it this way, he graduated from seminary. <laughs> Not with, uh, in, the, in more of the category of the Lodi Ha come. But he graduated. <laughs> And so he was assigned a church that was dead and dying and had less members in it than it had 125 years when it started. And I guess they figured what he would, couldn't do much harm down there. But after about two years down there, he uh, noticed that people in the denomination noticed it was really going great guns. They were in a building program, for heaven's sakes. So they decided, now you do an article on him. So they went down and they wanted to know his secret. <laughs> he said, he didn't have any secret. They said, well, what do you do? He says, well, I preach the word, I pray for the people, and I'm available. <laughs> well, a number of years ago when I was at Trinity, I had the privilege of going with another faculty member to an Anglican consortium in Africa. And uh, it was a very interesting experience. Um, the church in that part of the world was growing leaps and bounds. And one of the professors who was from uh, one of the Episcopal seminaries in New York, asked one of the bishops there what their secret was. Oh, it's always going to be a secret. What's your secret? And uh, they said, uh, well, we don't really have a secret. We tell people that they're lost in sin and that Christ died for their sins, and if they trust the Lord, they'll find salvation, and he can clean up their lives and use them. And this guy wouldn't be put off. He said, no, no, no. He said, I don't mean that. He said, I mean your secret. <laughs> you know, you've got to be doing something else. Um, I, think, I think sometimes we get so active in all the things that go along with the post and the position that we sometimes lose the vision of what really is important. Too busy to pray, too busy to be available, uh, something's wrong with the original. So here, he's going to restore them to a service and they're going to know that they are a people chosen by God and they are there to minister and to minister, they're going to be holy. And God will provide all the things that they need to be effective ministry. He will give them his word. He'll give them the prophets. Eventually, he'll give them the Messiah. The third section, though, is the basis for all of this. And that's the last couple of verses. Not only is God going to clean up the sinners, and not only is he going to prepare them for ministry, but he's going to make sure that the focus of their ministry, the focus of all spiritual service, is going to be on the Savior. Now, he won't call him that in this passage. He's going to use images, but they are extremely well-known images. And this is what he says. Listen, O high priest, Joshua, verse 8, uh, you and your associates, other priests, seated before you, you are men of signs of things to come. Uh, portent sign. There's, this is where the prophetic, prophetic element comes in. You've got a ministry, and this is a great ministry, and it's serving a purpose for now in God's program, but there's something else you need to know. 
you're signs of something that's coming, something that's greater than you. Your life, your ministry, your calling must signify something. I've always been amazed by that because, you know, I hang out with a lot of preachers and would-be preachers or whatever, and the question comes up, what, what, does, your, what does your ministry signify? Um, they're taken back a little bit by the question, uh, but we kind of tone it down a little bit, especially in an ordination exam. We'll say, what are you going to try to do to these people that you're ministering to? <laughs> well, I want to, want to encourage them, you know. Well, yeah, you want to encourage them, but, you know, is that it? Um, I get so tired of hearing people say, well, if you're going to preach, just tell your story. Your story doesn't really save people, I'm sorry to say. Um, <laughs> But the story of Christ does. And I think it's good to show relevance and that you're a real person and all of that. But you're called to do one thing, and that is to serve God. And in the Old Testament, these people knew that they were serving the Lord, and they knew that what was going on there was a stage in the process because the prophet told them they were men of signs. They were prophetic elements that they were going to be pointing towards something that was in the future that God wanted to do. They may not have understood it all. We should, because we now are living in the light of the gospel. And we too in ministry should be ministers that are a sign. A sign both of what has happened, but of more than that, what is to come, what is yet in the future. In order to convey that, what the prophet does is use two well-known images for the Messiah. The first one, he says, is that he is going to, um, there are going to be signs. He says, I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. The statement, my servant, is an interesting one in the Bible. It's not just used for anybody. It's used for somebody who is particularly devoted obedient, faithful. Very few people are called it. In fact, it's the highest title any human can ever have, the servant of the Lord. And it's not just a matter of, well, I really am going to serve because I'm giving my life. No, it means devotion, obedience. Moses is a servant of the Lord. David's a servant of the Lord. The Messiah is the suffering servant of the Lord. So it's a level of spiritual life and faith and influence unparalleled, out of the ordinary. And this one is going to be called the branch. <laughs> it's a very common expression. It's going to be describing a function of the one who is coming, this servant. It's one of about three or four Hebrew words to describe the nature of the Messiah as a branch. Uh, Isaiah starts us off with it when he talks about Israel as, as a tree. Uh, they love to use trees for kingdoms. So Israel is this tree. Um, actually, God did it before they got onto it, but uh, with the burning bush. But Israel is a tree. And Isaiah says in the captivity, God cut down the tree. It's gone. Except, according to Isaiah 6, there's a stump. He doesn't rip up the stump, there's a stump. And he says that stump of the cut down tree is the faithful, believing remnant. And in time, Isaiah says, out of that stump will come a little shoot, a little branch, and that little branch will be the Messiah. Um, he'll grow up as a tender branch and not kingly. This is when you get to Isaiah 11. He's, he's just a sprout, a shoot. Uh, out of uh, dry ground. I think, I don't want to get into it, but you can look at yourself. I think the Isaiah 11 passage is what's lying behind the statement in Matthew that he will be called a Nazarene. Uh, there's no passage in the Old Testament that says the Messiah will be a Nazarene. But the word in that passage for the branch is Natsur, which sounds like the word Nazareth. And both of them describe something that is humble and in fact, ignominious and not something that you write off. And Jesus comes and lives with his parents in Nazareth. And then Matthew says this is where the fullness of that message is going to take place. He'll be called a Nazarene. 
but it's a shoot. And out of Isaiah uh, 11, of course, came all of these medieval drawings of the Jesse tree and so on, because he's coming from Jesse. Not David, but from Jesse, who was not a king at the start, and neither was Christ when he first came. Uh, but we really get the image of the branch, most importantly, from Jeremiah. And if you have your scriptures and can turn over for a few minutes to Jeremiah 23, what Jeremiah is going to do is prophesy that the branch will be the, uh, a descendant of David, which means the covenant is not dead. The program is not dead. There may be no king on the throne after the exile, but the promise of a king is still there, and he's going to be called the branch. And so after he starts the chapter by saying he will remove the wicked prophets and the wicked priests, the shepherds, replace them with faithful ones, then he announces in verse 5, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. So the branch is going to be from the tree of David, which is the Davidic covenant. This will be the Messiah. He'll be a king. But there's going to be something said about this king that doesn't fit any other of the kings of Israel. He's going to be righteous. The world has never seen a righteous king. Not in the sense of what righteousness means. Some try hard. And there were a lot of people at this time in the days of Jeremiah. They heard him preach and they heard this prophecy that there's going to be a righteous branch. And so some of them took names that they thought they might be the one. Uh, we have these uh, kings, not very well known in Sunday school, Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim. But both of those names are taken off of the promises to David, that the Lord will establish a king, the Lord will raise up a king. They probably thought, that's they're talking about me, I'm the heir to the throne, and so he says he's going to raise up a righteous branch. The only thing is that they forgot it had to be a righteous branch. Those were reprobates. There were nothing, there's nothing righteousness about them. And since he was going to be a branch, and he's going to be righteous, and Jeremiah says that in those days the place and the system and the king will be known as the Lord our righteousness, one of the king changed his name to Zedekiah. Yahweh is my righteousness. But he wasn't righteous either, so it didn't apply to him. But they knew when they went into captivity, here is a promise of a branch to the line of David, and he's going to be righteous, and he's going to reign. Now, with that in mind, we get Zechariah, and he says that the Lord is going to provide this servant, the branch. But Zechariah has something else to say about this servant, the branch, and that's in chapter 6. In chapter 6, verse 9, the word of the Lord came to me, take silver and gold from the exiles, Heldai, Tobiah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon. Go the same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah, take the silver and gold, make a crown, and set it on the head of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak. Tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says, here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. Here's Joshua. He's the high priest. You make a crown, and you take this crown and you put it on his head. This is why it doesn't apply to Joshua. He's a sign that the one who's coming is going to be known as the branch, and now Zechariah is making it clear this branch, this servant of the Lord, this righteous one, is both a king and a priest. He's a priest because Joshua is the sign of him, and he's going to be this priest, but he's going to be a king. And you can't have that, a royal priest, under the old system. You have to have a new covenant, which is what Jeremiah is all about, with a new covenant, a new priesthood, not of the order of Aaron, It'll be a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. But he will be a priest and he will be a king. Now it may be that the political leader of the day, Zerubbabel, if you're familiar with this fellow, the name means the branch of Babylon. <laughs> it's possible he's the heir to the throne, he's the crown prince. Maybe he thought he would be this branch. But one problem, he can't be a priest. He's just a king. 
You can't have a king and a priest in the Old Testament world in the same person. Now the Maccabeans tried it. The priests who threw off the government of Syria and established a kingship, they took the crown and they pretended that they were king. It was disaster. People were welcoming the Romans in after a hundred years with the Maccabeans. But this was a ter terrible time, presumptuous and disobedient. God will raise up the branch. God will establish him as the high priest. God will establish him as the king. That's what they were supposed to be signs of. Their ministry, both in the way that they preached, the way that they taught, and in the way that they lived, was supposed to point the people ahead to a new covenant where there would be the Messiah, and the Messiah would be a priest and a king, because that's the only way that the sins of the current generation can be dealt with. This, this gets our, some people's minds floating in different directions, and it's kind of hard to get it settled. God is not bound by time. When God legislated all of the sacrifices for Israel in the book of Leviticus, he did it with Christ in mind. Because Christ was, so, was slain, according to the apostles, before the foundation of the world. Some people think, well, the New Testament writers, they were describing what Jesus did, and they say, hey, there's some coincidences here with Leviticus. Let's quote Leviticus. It's not that at all. God has Christ in mind. And in the designation of a king, he has Christ in mind. And in the priesthood of the king, he certainly has Christ in mind. The only other passage in the Old Testament that does this really well is Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And you'll be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, a king and a priest. This is the Messiah. That's the basis that we're going to have here for the forgiveness that is possible. A king could be a really good person, a righteous leader. You can't do anything about your sins. The high priest can. And that's where the salvation will come in and the basis for the cleansing of Joshua and countless thousands of others who have trusted the Lord and found forgiveness for their sins. The other image is a little more interesting for its unique twist. He's going to also be called the stone. The stone. This is a very common figure in the post-exilic word for the Messiah. Remember Daniel sees explains Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And then at the end, after he's seen this whole statue of all these kingdoms, he sees a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. And this stone rolls down and destroys the statue. And that stone becomes a kingdom that fills the whole world. That's Messiah the stone, king and his kingdom. Isaiah described him as a stone, either a stone that causes you to stumble or a foundation stone. Uh, either one. This is the Messiah. Psalm 118, a post exilic psalm, has it very clear. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief of the corner. In the days of the psalmist, the builders were the empires Babylon, Egypt, Persia. And here's a little puppet Judah, and they just throw it off like workmen throwing away a little piece that they don't think fits in anywhere. And all of a sudden, that little discarded piece becomes the centerpiece of God's program. And in the New Testament, Jesus explains that very clearly during Holy Week. He's the stone that has been rejected because he is representing Israel, and he is the Messiah. But he becomes the foundation of all this program of God. But Zechariah is going to give it a little different twist. He says he, he's going to see this stone here. It's set before Joshua, so it isn't on Joshua. And we're told it has seven eyes. Or a better translation, I think, would be seven, seven facets. It's a gem. They're not, a, they're not ignorant of gems. I mean, the high priest's robe is filled with gems that are sewn into the fabric, represent the tribes of Israel. But this one, this is going to be different. Some people think the seven facets means the Holy Spirit. Uh, I don't think that there's a clue enough in the passage for that. I think there's something more significant going on here. Notice what the prophecy says. I will 
cut or in, engrave the stone, he says, and I will remove the sin of the land in a single day. Now, however you take the cutting, the engraving, it has to be the explanation of the removal of the sin of the land in one day. Those two sentences just aren't thrown together. I mean, they would be if one of my students was writing it, but you know, it's <laughs> not the way that this Bible is written. There's a connection and a relationship between them. And so the cutting of the stone is going to effect the removal of the sin, and it's going to take place in one day. If I could put it in my own words, which may be a little bit free, uh, when our Lord came into this world in his first coming, he's like an uncut diamond. Uh, he's there, in all the glory inside, but it's concealed, it's not revealed. And on Calvary, when the stone was cut, the scars in the side, the nail prints in the hand, this is an old view, it's been around since the church fathers, when the cutting was done, that effected our salvation. That's the basis of our forgiveness. That's the removal of the sin. And the next time you see him, he will be as glorious as any cut diamond you would ever imagine. He will not come in rough and earthy and human form. You simply have to read Revelation 1 to get the full picture that this is brilliant, it's beautiful, it's glorious. And it's only that because he has done the one thing no human has ever done, and that is absolute obedient service to the Father. And that for him was to pay for the sins of the world. It's the way the book of Isaiah's book of uh, Suffering Servant starts off with a summary. He's high, lifted up, exalted. But let me tell you how he got there. Came down, died for sins, buried in the tomb. But when you see him, glistening, brilliant, bright, king of glory, and your high priest. Uh, those are the visions that Zechariah says, now you're priests. And I'm telling you what you're going to see and what you say and what you do, you've got to point people to God's Savior who will be your king and your priest. I can understand how some of the Old Testament priests and prophets might not have done that very well. I cannot understand how someone today can't do it very well because you have the scriptures, the fulfillment, the gospel, and above anything else, when the people come into the presence of the Lord, whether to hear a sermon or whether to hear or, or to worship, the center has to be the Savior. They have to see a vision in the word or in the message or in the service of the glorious, glorified, risen Christ and be reminded of how he got there and what he did for us because he was glorified in taking on the sins of the world. And that's what enabled God to cleanse Joshua. That's what enabled God to cleanse the Israelites. That's what enabled God to cleanse us. Someone paid for the sins. It's our Savior. And we are people of the sign, signifying the glories of Christ. So I think our task is pretty clear. We are to fill our ministries with the Savior. We are to live obediently as his servants. And we are supposed to challenge and direct people not to live in sin, but to live righteously. People don't do that much anymore. We don't talk much about sin. We don't talk about what, what God wants, but it's our duty. Um, we're we're too, too, too hesitant, too afraid for some reason. One of my favorite lines was written centuries ago. Uh, it's been a real hallmark for me for the years. It's written by Bishop Lancelot Andrews. If you don't know who he is, you need to read his life. <laughs> he personally translated Genesis to Samuel in the King James. But uh, Bishop uh, Lancelot Andrews, I'll put it in modern English, he said it is not our task to tell people what they want to hear. It is our task to tell people what in some sad future day they would wish they had heard. I think we've gotten away from that. And Zechariah reminds us there's a higher calling here.